Liz, it's an uh, absolute pleasure to have you at Sands Films. Thank you so much for coming to play um, and for having this chat with me. Um, Thanks for having me. What Thanks are you amazing. going to play tonight? I'm going to play mostly pieces for the Baroque lute tuned in D minor, uh, some of which were written for it, some Scottish tunes from a collection called the Balcarra's Lute Book, and sandwiched around those are two sonatas written originally for violin by Bach, um, and then I might have a little bit of surprising other music at the end. Excellent. Um, so they're originally violins and artists and who transformed them into lute music. What's the story there? And, and can you speak a little bit about transcription in general and how, it, how you see it? Well, I think the first thing to say is that Bach was transcribing other people's music constantly as a way of learning it. So there are concerti by Vivaldi that he wrote out and was really studying how other people were doing it. Obviously, there's no recording in the, the 17th and 18th centuries. Um, but also, conversely, people were transcribing his music. Um, so the first sonata exists in a version for organ, in a version for violin, um, and also in um, a couple of versions made by other lute players. There's a version that I rather like by uh, a player called Christian Behrauch, mm -hmm. who took it and made it idiomatic for the lute. Mm. The kind of lute that I'm playing is a little bit French. The tuning was um, really a product of 17th century France and experimentations with what it would sound like to be tuned all in thirds. So inevitably, when you're transcribing for that lute, you're, you're sort of filtering it through that slightly French yes. lens. Yes. Um, and instead of hiding that, he made it a feature of the piece and of course when it's for the organ you've got ten fingers you can play a bunch more notes so the harmony is much richer and then still other people go with the violin version and have that purity of the harmonies in your head you don't really hear it because the person with a bow won't always be stating it so I, I sort of go in between a lot of those different versions and uh, look at what other people have done so transcription is anybody who, who makes a transcription now is 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 in a way to part of an ongoing story of historical transcriptions it's not it's not you wouldn't say it's like a a big deal to to transcribe a piece of bar for a different instrument right no and particularly with the tradition for the lute in the 16th century the music that was written actually for the lute like dances and fantasies and stuff like that is in the minor minority most of the music was transcriptions of songs, sure. so chansons and prochelet and madrigals yeah. and stuff. So it's always very much borrowed other people's yeah. repertoire and, and we always kind of aim to be like singers and yeah. there's lots of people wrote lots of good advice about that. Mm -hmm. um, so that was the model. There wasn't really any sense that one mm. instrument had dibs gotcha. on absolutely everything. I mean, it raises, what your answers raise so many questions. Um, but you did say other lute players, so impl implying that Bach himself was a lute player. What, what was his relationship to the lute, do you think? What can you gather from, from the evidence? It's kind of a bit frustrating, right. actually, because he owned a lute made by a maker called Hoffman, and that was in his inventory. Mm. There isn't any evidence that he played it, and certainly the lute suites are written for a kind of cheap lute, um, a sort of epic lute. Uh, Lautenberger, which mm. is like a keyboard but has that lute sound, mm -hmm. which generally gives lute players a bit of a feeling of inadequacy because you can do so much more in terms of notes, but you get that lovely mm. soft edged thing. Um, and there are, there's a, a version of the um, C minor cello suite that's written in Bach's hand that's in a, in a library in Brussels, mm -hmm. and he said he did it for Monsieur Schuster. Mm. Um, and it's written in the alto clef, quite a forbidding clef mm -hmm. for lute players. Sometimes mm -hmm. in that era, we were, we were you know, playing off tablature or, or other things. And it's the same clef that the little obligati in the Matthew Passion, which was originally the gamba um, aria, was for lute. And in the St. John Passion, there's a, a small arioso as well. Um, also written in, in alto clef. And there isn't any one tuning on the lute that it fits really nicely and you think, oh yeah, I can really 
feel somebody's hands here as well as their mind. So it's mm. more like he liked the idea of the loop. I don't then think left he played it. it. I don't think so. I think, but I quite like that in a way. It fits with the 18th century and 17th century tradition of we'll give you a bass line and then you bring whatever instrument you like and make it yes. fit your hands and your mind. So which instrument do you think he did play apart from the keyboards and maybe violin, which he was famous for? I think, well, yes, those. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I think there is a record of him playing the viola as mm -hmm. well. And, yeah. and again, some... You think if you go and do the three minutes in the St John Passion, it's the most wonderful experience because you sit there and you get the whole mm -hmm. lot. And occasionally I insert myself into other areas, so mm -hmm. I've got something to do. But I'm not sure that it wasn't one of the viola players that just put down their viola and then yes. picked up a lute. Um, but nowadays we're not really quite in the swing of that. Yeah, of course. So, so what can the lute bring specifically the lute or the theorbo, a plucked instrument, what can it bring to his music that, that um, other instruments can't, would you say? Oh, um, some wrong notes now, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I never really think of it like that, actually. Mm. I don't really think of doing what somebody can't do. Right. I just sort of think, here's, here's my take on it. Yeah. Um, I think it's different. I think, particularly in the violin repertoire, something I've been thinking about is the fast movements are a bit less fast because yeah. you can't whiz through them sure. with a bow, but also when you're adding the odd bass note to make the harmony kind mm. of explicit, it just comes out differently. And in a way, I have to kind of my, I suppose my challenge is to get rid of the violin in my head yeah. and not feel like I have to sound exactly like that, but really internalise that sense of, this is now a loop piece. Right, it's and it the music is abstract enough to be able to do that. Right, it's not tied to specific uh, sonorities. Not really. I mean, I think some, and that's that's part of the fun of people listening is that some people say, "Oh, yeah, that really sounds mm. idiomatic," and other people will sort of hear that it's been somehow mm -hmm. transplanted from one yeah. place to another. And certainly, a lot of the rest of the repertoire is written very much by lute players. And you do sense that you are going inside somebody's yeah. um, sort of physicality. And sort their, of brain, and their finger sound. connection. Yeah, 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 yeah. And the little tricks that they use, um, mm. like Sylvia's Leopold Weiss, who met Bach, mm. and they did a kind of improvisation face-off, allegedly, mm. maybe apocryphal, but certainly knew about each other. Um, and Weiss's music is very much... Um, I won't say it falls under the fingers because it's it's still challenging, but it's challenging in a way that's suggested by the instrument. Mm. So obviously, we can also tell from your responses that you've you know you've spent so long studying this music. M more generally, now, what does Bach's music mean to you? Big question. But what can you say about that? Well, it's hard to summarise. Um, for me now, at my advanced stage, <laughs> um, Bach is one of the, the first classical composers I ever got excited by and attracted by when I was playing classical guitar, when I was kind of 10, mm. 12, that kind of thing. Um, I landed on some of his music, played it as best I could, but really got quite hooked. I had no idea that there was the rest of him. There was the choral music. There were the, there were the passions. There were the, you know, the whole world of the organ and the harp school. So that's been a kind of decades-long yeah. discovery. And I'd say now, um, particularly in the lockdowns, I mm. go to Bach for understanding. Mm. Sometimes it's solace, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's very challenging. But the whole cycle of those cantatas I was listening to quite a lot mm. in lockdown and I mm. just think it's a bit in the same way that people go to Shakespeare to get everything mm -hmm. um, you know he, he is one of many composers I'm not a sort of fan of the he, he dropped out of the sky no one else was doing one for music mm -hmm. but there is that sense of every experience of human life but also all the stuff beyond it if there was a world where the world was ordered into heaven and earth and then the emotions and mm -hmm. passion and reason all sort of came into that, it would probably sound like that. So sometimes I listen to it in a very 
in a way where I appreciate the balance and the order and the logic. Mm -hmm. And then in other ways, I just listen with all my heart and think, ah, that's just lovely. Beautiful. (laughs) That's a beautiful answer. Um, So, so, so with, 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 with the depth of what you just said, you're, you know, we're left just with a you know a manuscript. Um, what what is that manuscript actually? Is it um, is a Bach manuscript a kind of very detailed set of very precise instructions which have to be um, you know just simply executed? Or at the other it, at the other extreme, is it a kind of general conceptual architectural plan to be uh, creatively imagined? I think it's a bit of both. Um, sorry, that's a very British answer. <laughs> sort of, I sort of did set you up. It's kind that of way. everything. I mean, and also the fact that you know the um, some of his music is written by Anna Magdalena in her notebook. So there's a sense that the beautiful crafting of a lovely, you know, visually appealing manuscript mm. is like creating a, a sort of homage to the music mm. in itself. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's fixed. Mm. And, and stuff, but it's definitely more than a, a kind of ground plan. Um, but yeah, you get the sense that there, it's full of ideas, it's full of articulations. Um, cellists, for example, really study all the bowings and the slurrings and the not slurrings um, in in those suites. And in a way, on the loop, one's liberated from that because I'm going to approach articulation with that in my head, but very much on what will work. For, yeah. for the lute and something that I really like that's characteristic of the lute repertoire is, is that the articulation is a bit asymmetrical. Mm. It's not like if you repeat a phrase you have to do the same thing. Mm. Um, it might be in a different place on the instrument. Um, it will already sound different yeah, um, because of the instrument. And I, I quite like that because yeah. all the theory books say you shouldn't do that. You, right, should, right, you right. should be like a speech and sort Damn of match theory books. Yeah. sort of uh, something else. But people clearly just thought, well, this feels nice, mm. so I'll slow it this way. Mm. But then you, get, you do get this sense that Bach was thinking about that really closely. So I guess the way I would say is rather than feel I have to do that, I feel I have a responsibility to think about it really closely. Yeah. And that's what that beautiful manuscript kind of tells me. Yeah, fantastic. Um, so, so there's of course freedom in the music, and um, how did you learn to exercise that freedom in terms of things like ornamentation or improvised ornamentation? Or I mean, I was he- hearing you just warming up earlier, and you were playing uh, a melody, and it was very free. You know, it felt very free. So, how, how did you get to that? place to be able to do that because because that's something that's for me incredibly valuable you know in this in this music I think most things in my life anyway and probably in yours as well (laughs) sort of happened by accident so my early years were very much playing classical guitar music that's written down but in the rest of my life I was listening to the charts and to pop music and it never occurred to me to connect those two mm. that you know I had this very free approach when I was sort of um, singing yeah you know sort of human league in my bedroom but then when I played the classical stuff I was very concerned to get it right because yeah, that yeah. was what I sort of and um, and then when I sort of fell into lute playing really got some instruments you know started mm-hmm. um, taking those steps without consciously expressing it like that, I was starting to connect the two. And I thought, ah, okay, this music, if I sort of suffer learning the language and getting the hang of it, because my background in that was very um, sparse, you know, I didn't learn all that stuff particularly, Um, but learning it through figured bass harmonisation, how a musical phrase is constructed in certain times Mm. in the particularly 17th and 18th centuries, gave me that sense that maybe there's hope that you don't have to be the fastest, loudest, best, most perfect, but if you just don't sound like quite anybody else, Mm -hmm. then there's a place. Mm -hmm. So I I think it's as much about that as improvising gives you a sense that that's your signature. Mm -hmm. And you're not necessarily saying, you know, hey, I'm the greatest, but just, you know, this this is my voice with the voice of the thing that's already written down. So... 
you know, I've not done very much completely free improvisation. Mm. I'd like to one day. Mm. Um, we but, did some on that on but, the, uh, Abel's record. Yeah, indeed. That's yeah. Um, and I did feel a little bit like, oh, mm. I'm quite at sea now because yeah. where are my reference points? It's a bit like when you you kind of um, jump into a swimming pool and you're not a great swimmer, you want to see the sides. Mm. So that's where my improvisation is. And then when you took away the sides, it was yeah. like, oh, right. Where are they? <laughs> so um, that was very exciting. And it made me think, yeah, yeah I'd love to, yeah, to yeah. do more. It's thrilling, isn't it? When, it, when it's, yeah. when it feels right. Yeah, so so, so did, did your kind of musical education at some point, did it, did it actively encourage improvisation or decoration in, in, in a kind of minimal sense? Or was that something you just figured out by yourself? Once you were, you know, like studying full time. Yeah, I th yeah, I think once once I was into the loop side of of things, it's an intrinsic part of um, certainly what you do when playing with other people. You you don't have a score, mm. so you you have a baseline, and then um, you get the hang of that, and then that influenced my approach to well, all of our approaches to the solo music, you mm -hmm. realise that actually that's written down by people who are spending their days and nights improvising in a certain style and that just certain pieces happen to be a written down snapshot yeah. of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you said you, you, listen, you listen to a lot of pop music when you were a kid and stuff. Do you connect singer-songwriters like John Dowland, one of the most famous ones, from the past to contemporary ones? Yeah, um, I think there's a, a real sense, for me also, I love words, I love text, I love working with singers, I'm sort of, I think if you play with singers a lot, you have to have a little bit of you that's fantasising that it's you that's singing, and even though you're doing the play, and my singer friends make fun of me for that when they get, perhaps you like singing. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, um, but that sense that the music comes from the text and the text comes from what you want to say and what mm. you want to express and then the music might comment on that or take it somewhere else mm. or make it hurt more or mm. more joyful or whatever. I, I do see, that's the way I listen to, to a contemporary singer-songwriter, that's the way I listen to Dowland. Um, is, and that's the way I try and work on Dowland, is text first, then voice, then loop, really yeah. sort of in that order mm. um, and there is something about um, for Down and there's a lot written about you know he wrote lots of melancholy music and that was an Elizabethan thing um, but the more I've learned about it over the years and, and gone a bit into the background that the melancholy is genuine but it's also performed mm. and that's really interesting because that's what we all do as teenagers we perform our suffering first and then we get the hang of that and then we're still doing it at the end of yeah. our lives so and pop music is a, a big exactly the, the stylization right? of great yeah. extreme yeah. feeling so i think it's quite funny that the the scholarly books say yes he was very very miserable he probably wrote his own texts because they're very sad mm -hmm. and then you know right, um i do listen to adele or whatever and i yeah. think yeah you do one does use your own experience mm -hmm. but it's gone through a lot of filters yeah but there's something about your instrument which is just magical and in, in the sense that it, it transcends all time. It's just a portable plucked instrument which you can strap to your, to your body and sing with. Which, and this is true in, in, you know, still now. Is there something, do you feel kind of connected to that lineage anyway, even, even if you're not a, even if you weren't singing uh, on stage? Yeah, definitely. And, yeah. and I like that it. Um if you're a plucker, you're a plucker. It blurs the boundaries between what's rock, what's pop, mm. what's folk. You know, I, I grew up learning chords, playing yeah. playing in folk religious things at my school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> sort of that tradition um, before I discovered the kind of, you know, German contrapuntal way of doing religious music. So I think that's, that's really important mm. to me that it, um, on one day I can be super classical in that, environment but on another day we do have that connection that mm. very direct connection with people yeah so what what kind of qualities do you admire in other types of musicians or who play in other genres um what are the things that you think they can teach you and what can you what what what's your type of musician really good at that other people aren't aren't so good at 
I say you're a type of musician as if you're one thing. I know you're a million things, but nevertheless. No, I think, um, I mean, I've learned so much from, from my occasional forays into collaboration with other, mm. other um, musicians from other traditions, yourself in, included. And what I really, so rhythm is a massive thing. Mm. Um, there is colleagues sometimes is talk about, oh, is that a lute player rhythm thing when mm. you're being a bit kind of flaky and a bit, <laughs> um, you know, and do one of those links that doesn't go anywhere mm. kind of thing. And I have this, bare, this sort of barely conscious sense that there's a different sense of rhythm. And then I remember doing um, actually a pop session and doing kind of da, 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 those sort of broken chords that yeah. guitar, session guitarists just do all the time. Mm. And I, w I was unconsciously not knowing it, being very Baroque, going da 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 Very free, da, da. yeah. And, you know, when we'd done seven takes and the engineer going, just play it in time. And I'm going, I am. I <laughs> yeah, am. But, yeah, yeah. you know, that sense of time being a little bit rubato and a little bit a function of the right. rhetoric and all that. It's such a Baroque thing S yeah. that I'd internalised it and I couldn't just play eight quavers. Right. Um, and eventually I did with lots of eye rolling in the <laughs> box. But know, probably so. <laughs> you were playing it in time according to what your sense of time is as in probably like the bar the beginnings of each bar were absolutely that in was, place and, and yeah. the stuff in between was quite yeah. free whereas in time for a pop producer it might mean like literally every division of the bar is yeah. quantized you know and equally spaced which is maybe if you play baroque music like that then it sounds kind of horrible right yeah and that's the but yeah, that's the function of how it's made and who it's made for. Yeah. If you are flaky around the beat, then when you layer it up and, and mix it, then then it's it's pretty yes. horrible. It's a mess, yeah, as yeah. well. So yeah, it's it's a question of um, what's right for what particular occasion. Mm. So, what what's what's your ultimately what's the impulse to play old music for you, and. Um, you know, what, what would you say to somebody who, who questioned the relevance of old music, whatever that means? Um, well, first of all, I'd say, what do you mean by old music? And I remember doing a, a great project with um, ukuleles, with, with members of the ukulele orchestra of Great Britain, and we went round, as part of an educational thing, we went round loads of primary schools, and we said to the kids, like, we're going to do some some newish music and some old music. So we picked the ones that were based on the same three chords, uh -huh. again, so that we wouldn't be too, um, it wouldn't be too strange, yeah. you know, that people could understand, actually, these are just the building blocks of any old music yeah. um, or any music. Yeah. Um, and I remember saying to the, to the children, well, we, you know, when do you think the old stuff was written? Thinking they might say 300 years, 400 years ago, and, and one very bright, young lad raised his hand and said 1990 yeah um, so it made me think okay yeah this is this is all about me and my perspective old music is hundreds of years ago mm -hmm. but actually anything that wasn't written this morning mm -hmm. becomes old and filtered through somebody else but that said um i do think that we especially now we're very self-aware of our own kind of points of view and perspective we can engage with the idea that there are other points of view and that music means something different, that we understand it on um, a very basic emotional level, mm -hmm. but actually going into what was this music for? What, what does it mean to play music when the rest of your life is actually quite silent, you know, and doesn't have the background kind of noise? How does that help us understand this music? Um, a lot of these instruments are very much based on feel and sensation. They're not mm. based on volume mm. um, so much. So you start to listen in a different way. Mm. Um, and playing in a small venue like this mm. suddenly connects with that older, um, that older music. I think that, yeah, it's, it's like sort of, you know, going on holiday to Italy and or, you know, you sort of... You speak the language, but you also try and do the accent because that's more fun. Mm. And then you get that extra oral sense mm. of what's going on. Or, you know, if you're on a football field, you kind of learn the rules of football. And if you were playing the rules of rugby, you'd feel a bit kind of 
out of it. Yeah. Um, so that for me is really interesting. Is mm. it's, is experiencing to the best. I can, because I'm not an 18th century person, thank goodness, you know, I have a much better life, especially as a woman. Sure. Um, so obviously there are limits to it, but it just gets me out of my own imagination, mm. you know, that, that probably I have had it like everyone else. Mm-hmm. Um, so if I read something and I think, oh, they thought of it like that, for example, I don't know, the example is um, Francis Bacon talking about echoes being louder than the first statement sure. of something if you're in a kind of particular weird architectural setup yeah and that makes me think oh maybe i could do that in the yeah. music maybe they weren't always thinking like us you do a phrase loud and then you do it quietly mm. you know it's just it's ideas really Definitely. that's that's what i get yeah i mean of course i i wouldn't um i wouldn't be one of those people to question the relevance of old music but i think that's a great <laughs> i think we have to that's... yeah we can't take i mean music in general actually if i'm yeah. honest as soon as we sit back and think, well, obviously it's important, sure. then we've lost, yeah. you know, we've lost the yeah, argument. Yeah. And how do you, one of the things that interests me most, and I, as a musician myself, I have to kind of keep thinking about all the time, playing different styles of music like, like you do. Um, you know, I have to keep on top of it, this, this, this thing of controlling the boundaries between styles of music. Um, I feel like if I don't stay on top of that in a kind of mentally disciplined way, then everything goes to shit, basically. <laughs> so how do you do that? Um, you know, how do you control what, how much your Bach playing affects uh, earlier music? Um, the mannerisms of one style might sound completely inappropriate in another, and how much do you let those things you know, feed into each other, and how much do you just separate them? I think... And this is the perspective of a lute player, and a lot of people, in a way, the a lot of people would say the second question for your why is it relevant is why do you play it on the old instruments that go out of tune all the time? And you know, there's a, it's so many things that mm. that are peculiar and can go wrong. They're not loud enough. And so, if I just give you a little bit of an example, this Please. is sort of to answer your question, but to say it's actually a bit easier for me. Um, so what? Oops. Once I get this instrument, see what I mean? Um, <laughs> <laughs> there we go, voila. Um, it's sort of um, that it's tuned in thirds, so it's very easy to do a chord like that, which leads you to... And immediately I'm in France or sort of early 18th century Germany, and it's very sort of handy to do that. And there's a lot of slurring because of the way the instrument resonates. If I was to pretend this was a Renaissance loop, my hand might be in a different place, and I might be doing this, and then I'm sort of a much more articulate thing, and immediately we're into kind of scale. Um, whereas it just comes out of the instrument, and yeah. then suddenly it's a different way of ornamenting. Yeah. Or, or, um, so it starts off by, weird, you know, the weirdness of the loop is also mm. quite helpful, because the technique changed so much from different instruments. I say it does start out like the Christmas card angel from plectrum playing. Yeah, I got your arm persuaded to play to try a medieval once with a peacock feather, and I, I thought it sounded not great. To be perfectly honest, I you know when uh, many things when I retire, um, I will get the hang of plectrum playing, but I haven't I haven't mastered it yet. <laughs> so do you think the the, um, the, the, st- the stylistic difference is there more of like a technical thing or a thing of technology like a, like a plectrum of some sort, or rather than a mental um, distinction. I think it's very chicken and egg. Yeah, you know, yeah. I don't know which is the egg and which is the chicken, mm. um, but I do know that there's a very um, direct relationship between what you feel and then what you decide is the rule. Mm-hmm. And I also that's the thing with improvisation. Nobody improvises things that are completely unnatural to them. Mm-hmm. You go within your own sort of technique, but then you also make forays out of it and try something. But you don't live in your sure you know, um, uh, sort of extreme hinterland. And I think that's quite similar as well. The types of ornamentation or which is a very, um, you know, the jumping bass lines, you can see that's around the keyboard with somebody doing this with their hands. But but it sounds like maybe you've arrived at a place just through years and years of study where where you just sort of feel instinctively what's correct in, in which period rather than having to like consciously say, okay, no, I mustn't do that because 
yeah. that will sound wrong or you know inappropriate or whatever. Whereas I, I, I'm still in a place where like I'm sometimes I feel like I'm I, my impulse is to play certain things in say a, a jazz context which might sound which might be quite baroque in a way, and then I'm really not. I'm, I get slightly confused about whether I like it. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> but um, that's. I mean, that's the brilliance. If if you're really at home in several different styles, that's just going to happen. I think that's great. Mm -hmm. So we need musicians of both types. Mm -hmm. You know, this is to me living physically inside that, so it's more clear. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, I don't have that fluency to suddenly introduce jazz chords because I don't sure, know them well sure, enough. Sure, sure, you know. Sure. So I think we need both types of musician and it's never wrong. Yeah. And and how do you how do you how do you create resonance on such an instrument where the sound, you know, just uh, sort so I should of say it's slightly more, does more die properly. Yeah. Does die I mean, straight away. Yeah, in, the, in this you can see I've got double strings. So I'm, I'm, what I'm doing is this very bad classical guitar technique. I've got a very relaxed mm. fingertip and I try and then go through both strings, yeah. which will sound different to that. Sure. I mean, occasionally you'll probably hear a bit of that tonight <laughs> if you don't judge it quite right. But also the tuning in octaves gives you um, the high octave, gives you a bit of brightness on yeah. that. Um, so there is a bit more kind of um, ring to it, mm. whereas on a, a single string instrument I might be a little bit less pushing the string in and just going across it for that kind of bite. Um, and, and your left hand, does that do a lot to maintain resonance by holding notes down yeah, when they've you know, kind of officially stopped, let's say? Yeah, as much as as much as you can, and as particularly can. that's the that's the the tragedy and the joy of counterpoint is mm. that you can never really do it because you haven't got a bow mm. um, or an organ or whatever. But mm. it's to try and create the illusion that the notes aren't mm. dying, um, and that I mean, there's loads of you know again the I suppose the relevance of the past is there's loads of paintings about the broken string, mm. you know, means death, um, mm. without being too um, kind of uh, dark about it, that is built into these instruments. Every note is, is a bit of a death. And you're, you're always trying to overcome that, which is, isn't that what we're all doing? <laughs> I don't know. And on that note, I think that is the perfect place to stop. Thank you so much. For Thank this. you. It's been well, great to chat to you. Thanks thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Take it around.